And I'd like to thank all of our attendees for tuning in today for the first uh, installment of a webinar series entitled Getting Comfortable with Designer Air. Today's webinar is focused on four key things you need to know about modulation technologies. And our agenda is shown as follows. I'm going to start off by discussing the role and need for modulation technologies in the air conditioning marketplace. My colleague, Ken Monier, is then going to discuss the benefits of modulation technologies and how those modulation technologies can help meet those needs. I'm then going to describe some of the applications ideally suited for modulation technologies. As our technical leader, Ken Monier, is going to wrap up the presentation with an overview of the basic types of modulation technologies available in the marketplace today. So I'd like to get started by reviewing the role of modulation technologies. And I think it's important to note that it's not just a want, it's a need in today's ever-changing marketplace. When we talk about the role of modulation technologies, I really tend to focus on two areas. One is the changing legislative and regulatory landscape. And that's really uh, depicted through a number of different uh, standards and regulations. For those of you who participate in the residential air conditioning business, you are no strangers to the 2015 regional standards that went into effect at the start of the year. That was uh, relatively uh, a relatively a game-changing event in that for the first time, the residential marketplace was carved out into three regions, with each region having a different uh, uh, efficiency standard, and modulation can play important roles in achieving those, those efficiency needs. Now, in the commercial marketplace, we tend to focus on ASHRAE 90.1 as our bearing for efficiency requirements or, or standards in the marketplace. ASHRAE 90.1 is typically revised every three years, and so many people are looking at how to stay compliant with the most recent version of ASHRAE 90.1. Further complicating this is the fact that the Department of Energy has gotten involved and made some proposals for even higher efficiency levels, and modulation may become a very key part in how we achieve those standards going forward. Additionally, there are voluntary standards that various uh, localities or even individual buildings can choose to pursue. Those might be things like Energy Star, uh, the Consortium for Energy Efficiency, or CEEs, various tiers, which are often tied to utility rebates, and then the Department of Energy's own rooftop unit challenge, which again uh, aims for some very high efficiency levels in the marketplace. The second important role that modulation technologies can help fill is in meeting customers' preferences. Those customer preferences may take the forms of various identified needs, which might include enhanced comfort, reducing operating costs or energy costs, uh, installing premium technology, and, and delivering overall system value to uh, the marketplace. Now, if we dive a little bit deeper into the efficiency standards, I'd like to talk first about uh, residential standards. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the United States was carved out into three zones that have increased efficiency standards prior to this. 13 SEER was the requirement across uh, all 50 states. With these new standards, states in both the South and Southwest move up to 14 SEER as a new minimum requirement. Now, modulation may not be required to deliver uh, 14 SEER, but if you look at the graph on the left, you'll see that uh, there's generally a tiering strategy that takes place within the industry. Some might refer to it as a bit of a good, better, best strategy. Um, again, modulation may not absolutely be required in some of the uh, good or base units, but certainly achieving some of the mid-tier or premium tier systems uh, will certainly benefit from modulation technologies. A few things to note on this chart. One is that as these efficiency regulations take effect, we anticipate a growing mid and premium tier in the marketplace. So ultimately, more and more of the market may start to take advantage of these modulation technologies. It's also important to know that modulation may become um, a, 
a way of fulfilling needs, not only in the, uh, the 14 SEER segment, but in what we're referring to as the 14 SEER featured segment. That becomes a nice way of differentiating base equipment in the 20 states in the South or Southwest uh, that have a 14 SEER requirement, but modulation can offer an additional feature that can provide differentiation amongst those units. Now, if we change gears to the commercial landscape, uh, the, the dynamics here are a little bit in flux. The chart that I'm showing here is listing IEER, or Integrated Energy Efficiency Ratio requirements, for commercial air-cooled package and split systems. And you'll see various columns uh, corresponding to different uh, tonnage ranges. As a baseline, I've provided the ASHRAE 90.1-2010 standard. Many equipment manufacturers had been designing for the ASHRAE 90.1-2013 requirement, which in general had an increase in efficiency in the neighborhood of 10 to 15 percent uh, boost in part load efficiency. As I mentioned earlier, the Department of Energy had proposed some new IER levels that would be effective at the end of 2018 or early 2019. Those efficiency levels dramatically boost part load efficiency requirements, increasing uh, efficiency over today's 2010 standards by approximately 30%. Modulation can be a very key uh, component in how manufacturers might meet those higher efficiency levels. With that, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Ken Monier, to talk a little bit more about the various benefits of modulation technologies. Thanks, Bart. And in terms of benefits, we can also think about enablers of modulation technologies because we're really trying to do a number of things uh, in, in a very complex way uh, to meet all these uh, existing and emerging needs uh, that, that, are, um, that the industry is faced with. In terms of comfort, you know, we probably all experienced a, a personal situation where we, we are... Um, we're feeling the temperatures get uh, uncomfortable, either high or low, and then and maybe we get comfortable for a while, and then we're not. And so this this notion of being able to control in a more precise manner, and also uh, where we need the comfort, is is a, an important part of uh, what we can do with modulation technology. Uh, we show an illustration on the left here showing that if we're able to uh, use a modulating system to control temperatures, we can do so. We can match the, the load, which may be very stable or it may be uh, the thermal load may be moving around significantly, uh, but we're able to match that load as it, as it varies in a more precise manner. Uh, this is also important not only in comfort uh, arenas, but also in areas where um, the, the ability uh, for uh, desire for precise control is very important. In, the, in this whole comfort space, it's not only about uh, the absolute temperature control, it's also about uh, the relative humidity uh, control and, and levels. And so modulation gives us an opportunity to uh, significantly enhance uh, the air exchange over a, a period of time uh, to remove the appropriate amount of moisture from the air without uh, significantly overshooting uh, temperature control. So the idea of having a, a system which is, uh, would, would appear to be a little smaller in terms of addressing the load, the actual uh, temperature control um, demands, uh, can, can exchange air and uh, make sure that the entire uh, volume of air is exchanged to the level of comfort that is desired from a humidity control. So Again, making, uh, making these systems uh, perform uh, in, in a very comfortable way is uh, one of those ways we can look at modulation being an enabler. And as we said on the, on the, uh, at the beginning, though, you know, it's just not about comfort in this case. It's also about those future regulations that Bart talked about and the need uh, to make these systems be uh, very precise in their ability to control but also to be very, very efficient uh, from an energy consumption point of view. So Bart touched on some of the ways that we look at energy consumption. Uh, we, we talk in terms of energy efficiency ratios where we're really looking at 
the uh, in, in many times we're talking about a full load system efficiency when we talk about EERs or energy efficiency ratio, uh, which is the, the cooling capacity divided by the uh, power consumption, you know, usually in terms of the electrical inputs to a system. And we, so historically, we've looked at those as a good metric of a, of a system in terms of how efficient it could be at that one uh, particular load point, uh, typically a 95 degree uh, outdoor ambient at, with, other, with several other uh, specific uh, condition, um, conditional applications around it. In the future, we look at the ability to be energy efficient, not only uh, at some of the higher load points, but also at some of those lighter load points, because we know that those uh, systems are going to operate over a fairly large load range. And we certainly want to be able to make those systems accommodate those various load ranges, but do it in a very efficient way. So integrated efficiency, uh, the integrated energy efficiency ratio, the IEER metric that he mentioned before, allows us to look at a weighted basis, as we show on the right, where we can, we can pick a load point and then look at percentages that are weighted uh, based on uh, expected profiles of operation. Of course, these aren't perfect, but they certainly give us the ability to look across uh, a wider range of operational parameters to make some judgment about how energy efficient and how energy conscious a system might be. And so you can just see the simple uh, algebraic expression relative to the, uh, the way we calculate that uh, integrated energy efficiency ratio over a range of operating characteristics. But what that does is it allows us to make these systems look either rather, uh, rather large or rather small in a very energy efficient way uh, to match the load requirements that we're dealing with. It may be fairly, um, straightforward in, in a, uh, let's say, something like a, a typical residential application, but in many commercial applications, so this could be very complex because not only uh, due to ambient conditions, but also uh, changes that are occurring within the uh, condition space in terms of occupancy or in terms of other uh, loads other than just ambient um, temperature, such as solar loads. When we look at what is possible, we certainly see that uh, making these systems not only be able to scale appropriately over a wide load profile, but to do it in a very efficient way can drive very significant uh, energy reduction in, in the terms of uh, 30 to 40 percent. So this means not only uh, being uh, certainly more energy conscious, but also reducing significant operating costs along the way. We just show several examples of where modulating uh, compression technology, uh, the types of savings that, that have been uh, observed in uh, various applications, uh, whether it be variable speed or digital technology. And we'll talk about those technologies in a few moments. You know, next, in terms of what else does this enable, it certainly uh, provides um, a very reliable solution. Oftentimes when we talk about Making things um, move, make things more flexible. We we get uh, raise concerns about are we making it more complex than it needs to be? But actually, we're able to uh, improve reliability uh, by the ability to only um, really size the equipment um, in a, in a flexible way to accommodate the loads, uh, longer run times, which reduce cycling, uh, which is inherently beneficial for any uh, rotating mechanical equipment. Um, that would be true for all components in the in the system, but particularly true for the prime mover, uh, the uh, vapor compression um, device, uh, the, the compressor in these systems. We also have uh, the emergence of a number of controls. Uh, for example, we have uh, climate technologies, core sense technology, uh, which can integrate into drives and other control schemes. Uh, that optimizes operation, can enhance some of those performance characteristics, but can also enhance the reliability, our ability to see problems before they exist, uh, and really evaluate um, the health and welfare of a number of the componentry uh, within these systems. And then we'll talk about multiple compressor schemes 
in a few moments, but those certainly offer a greater uh, degree of redundancy. And if we think about uh, particularly uh, scenarios such as commercial applications, many of which have very, very uh, high uptime operational needs, uh, this is a way to add some uh, system flexibility and redundancy uh, to achieve those high uptime uh, capabilities. Next, I'm going to turn it back to Bart, who's going to talk a bit about the applications uh, that really are well aligned for these modulation technologies. Thanks, Ken. As we think about those applications that might be potential homes for modulation technologies, I'd like to encourage the audience to, to think uh, broadly about those applications. And again, it's not just for premium systems. That tends to be what everyone thinks of right off the bat. But there are a, 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 a plethora of potential applications for these types of modulation technologies. And I'd like to walk through a, a few examples. Um, in general, I tend to break things into, into two categories. In residential applications, uh, really the only place that we don't see a home for modulation technologies might be in the base tier. Mid-tier systems and premium tier systems are perfect candidates for modulation technologies. Within the commercial space, I, I also look at these in uh, meeting two primary needs here. One is for applications that require load matching or potentially have varying loads at different times of day. Another subset of, of applications might be those that have very precise temperature or humidity control requirements. And I'll offer a few examples on both of those. As we think about residential applications, 